Okay, well, friends, I'm excited today because I get to share kind of like the main message for y'all today. And then Pastor Alex is going to come and we're going to kind of like tag team. And um, we're just going to flow with it. So, but I got so excited. Who was here last Sunday? That was powerful. I mean, every Sunday is. Every Sunday is so unique and special and amazing. But, man, last Sunday was special. It was so powerful. The anointing of God was so good. And as I was sitting here in my seat, I was getting ministered to. Don't think because I'm the pastor I don't come and get ministered to. I am, I am first in line. <laughs> you know, I get to hear the message twice because he usually preaches to me, you know, behind the scenes. And then I get to sit here too and receive. And I'm telling you, as I was sitting here, the Lord was ministering to me and showing me some things and I was like has God ever like shown you something you just it's just like fireworks on the inside you're just like oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh so you know I was like I can't wait to share this because um it really blessed me did that dirt come from my shoes oh dear I am so sorry whoops okay all right well y'all turn in your Bibles let's segue out of that um turn in your Bibles first Samuel 18 Note to self, if you're ever building something, don't put light carpets in your house, in your church. Mm -mm, don't do it. Uh, 1 Samuel 18. We're going to start there. Y'all know I've been all about the story of David. And I thought I was done with it, but I'm not. <laughs> so neither are you, friends. Okay. 1 Samuel 18. Okie dokie. This is... We're going to dance all around um, the first and second Samuels today. So have your Bibles or your smartphones ready. All right, this is verse, uh, we're going to go from verse 1. When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. Jonathan is Saul's son, by the way. Saul was the king of Israel, the first king of Israel. His son, Jonathan, was his son. And David was the one anointed to be king after Saul. Okay, just a little context there. So when David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own life. So Saul took David that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant. Somebody say, a covenant. <laughs> Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own life. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him, and he gave it to David in his armor, even his sword and his bow and his girdle. And David went out wherever saw him. Okay, so now we have talked before in the past about covenant many times, but even like in Bible days, what a covenant looked like. Like we say covenant and our best um, application of that is like a marriage covenant, you know, like a, it's a partnership, right? But back in those days, if we were to rewind and go back to Genesis and we could go through like what a covenant actually looks like, there's nine steps taken when two parties come together. It was more than just a legal binding con contract, though it was that. So, and there were all these steps that they did and, you know, it has, there, there's, I don't have time to get into it today, but it was like, you know, that's why it says like Jonathan gave his, his sword to him and his robe to him. And you're like, why is Jonathan undressing himself and giving all this stuff to David? And it's not, it's a significant part of a covenant. When a covenant is made, when they would take off their robe and say, it was like signifying what is mine is yours. They would give his sword, say, my protection is now yours. So if you get in trouble with an enemy, I'm coming to your rescue and I'm going to stand up for you just as if they were coming against me. Because if they touch you, they touch me, right? There's so much depth to just even the, the steps behind a covenant, where it originated, and even so many things that we do today. For example, even in the marriage, in the marriage vows, you take on your spouse's last name. Ladies, you take on your husband's last name, right? Because no longer are you distinguished as two separate people. You're now one, right? So David and Jonathan, they made a covenant, yeah? And that's where, that's, I just wanted to visit that really quick because that is significant to the story that we're going to get in today. But they were in covenant with one another, meaning they were like blood brothers. And the Bible doesn't specify if they even did the blood part. Many times that's, what a, that's one of the steps of a covenant where they would actually like mix their blood, you know. They don't do that anymore, thank God. But um, like back in, the, in, back in the days, like when your parents would say back in the days, that's like how far back it goes. Like where, you know, stupid kids when they were young would do stuff like that where they like cut their fingers and like, you know, 
mix their blood and are like, you're my blood brother. Okay, maybe that still happens nowadays. But that came out of the steps of covenant. That was often one of the steps that they took, right? Like it was serious. And, and guess what? Isn't that present in, inside a marriage? When a marriage is consummated, not to get too like, you know, detailed about it, but there is an exchange of blood, okay? So, you know, there's so many things that parallel to that. But we'll suffice it to say they were covenant brothers, yes? Yes? You follow me? Okay. All right, y'all got to talk with me today because we're going deep, okay? We're going, turn to your neighbor and say, we're going deep. Because how many of you know Pastor Ox has been talking about the blessing of God, right? And we need to rewire what we think that means to us. Because you have an idea of what the blessing is. And like he was saying last week, sometimes we use that term so loosely. Like, I'm blessed, you're blessed, we're blessed, I'm blessed and highly favored. You don't even know what that word means. Amen? But I believe after some of these messages, you're going to know all about that word. Okay? You're going to know what that word means. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to know what it means to be blessed. Okay, but for real. So whatever preconceived idea you have about what the blessing is, just come with a blank slate on that today. Okay? 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 Okay. All right. Second Samuel now. Go to Second Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 4. We're going to talk about, I don't know, guys. This might be one of my new favorites. <laughs> it's really fun. This is exciting. This is going to bless you. Okay. How many of you guys have ever heard about Mephibosheth? Anybody? Raise your hand if you've heard about the character Mephibosheth in the Bible. Okay, not too many people. Oh, this is going to be extra fun then. Y'all didn't even know there was a guy named Mephibosheth because who would ever name their kid Mephibosheth, right? That is not on the list of 100 most popular baby names. Not back then and not now. Um, Mephibosheth. Like Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. I'm going to get it all messed up. I, I say we just give him a nickname, call him little Meffy. Meffy. We're going to call him Meffy, okay? So if I call him that for the sake of uh, not spitting on the front row here, y'all just go with it. Okay. 2 Samuel 4, we're going to start at verse 4. Jonathan, remember Jonathan is Saul's son, okay? Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was crippled in his feet. Someone say he was crippled. Okay, this is how he got crippled. This is terrible. He was five years old when the news came out of Jezreel of the deaths of Saul and Jonathan. So Saul, the king at the time, and Jonathan, his son, were killed in battle. Okay? And so when news of that came, it says the boy's nurse took him up and fled. And in her haste, he fell and became lame. So, and his name was Mephibosheth. Okay? So that's a sad story. All right? Because here you have little Prince Mephi, okay, and he is in line for the, the, the throne, basically. He's the grandson of the king of Israel. I mean, you can look on the, um, you see how, like, the people in England still do their whole monarchy thing, and, like, when one of those little princes is born into the family, it's like the whole world stops to look at that baby. Why? Because he's the heir to the throne. He's a prince that's just been born, right? He lives a very royal and privileged life, yes? similar to our friend little Mephibosheth here, okay? So he's born into royalty. He's born into privilege. He's born into, he's got it made in the shade, right? He lives in a palace. He's got his own permanent nanny, caretaker, you know? And he's just one of the king's sons, one of the, prince, one of the, the, the king's grandsons. So to say that he had it made, I think you guys understand how he had it made, right? He had it made. He had his whole life taken care of. His whole future was secure. But then in one day, his entire world got flipped upside down. He goes from having a very secure future, being born into royalty, to losing everything in one day. All because this news came that Jonathan and Saul had died. So why was it such a, a like a, why was it so important that they get out of, get out of, you know, go where they were going in such a hurry? Like, why they got to be in such a hurry? They had to be in such a hurry to get out of where they were because back in those days, when the king would die and his other successors would die and there was a new kingdom being established on the throne, meaning that there was a new leader coming into power, the heirs of the previous uh, king we're all going to be exterminated. 
so that there was no competition for the, for, the, for, the, for the throne of the new king. You understand? So they knew, okay, someone else is coming to sit on the throne. And that means I am now, I have a big target on me because I'm the grandson of the king. So I am a threat to the new kingdom. So they are going to, okay, my, my grandfather and my father just died. I'm next. So they were in a hurry to get out of there, right? So the nurse is like, come on, Mephi, we got to go. And, and they're running fast, right? <laughs> Much how we all do, all the moms do to get your kids to church on Sunday morning, okay? You're like, we got to get out of here. So in their haste to get out the door, Brother Mephi done fell down and busted both his legs, okay? And I don't know if it's like they didn't want to take him to the hospital because they were afraid someone was going to rat them out and then, you know, they're just going to come kill them there. I don't know. But needless to say, it was a really bad accident to the point where he never recovered from it and he was lame for the rest of his life. Someone say, oh, that's sad. Okay. Think about a five-year-old kid who's like destined to be the king. He goes running, jacks up his legs. Now he's no longer king. He don't got a daddy. He's away from his mama and he can't walk. So it's not like, you know, Okay, in our days, we are very accommodating to um, someone who might have a handicap, right? We got handicap parking. We got fancy wheelchairs. We got, um, you know, they're going to give you a job because, you know, they're going to just give you a job because they, they, they want to have equal opportunity, right? So, like, you know, it, okay, here's handicap. Like, if you're handicapped in this day and age, you can still make it in life, right? Hello. I mean, it's not without some challenges, but you can still make it in life. Okay, back then it wasn't like that. So not only is he now an outcast, because he's, as long as he is alive, he's a target. Someone say he's a target. Okay, so he's a target. He is forever a target. That's number one. Number two, he's crippled. And when you are crippled back in those days, you are worthless. Because he doesn't have a place in, in royalty anymore. So what's he going to do? How's he going to take care of himself? How's he going to earn a living? All of his financial provision was absolutely cut off. So the brother was having a bad day, okay? It was a bad life at that point. It was a bad turn of events. Everything was going wrong for Brother Mephi, okay? So what happens with Mephibosheth? He goes out. They run. He breaks his legs. Or he cripples his legs, whatever. And then he goes out to live in this place called Lodebar. Somebody say Lodebar. It was Lodebar. It was below Debar. But what Lodebar actually means is a place of no pasture. Okay, so Lodebar, it was like out in, it was like a desert arid region where nothing grew. It was not, like, think of, like, a, a, just a really ugly, desolate place. It was, like, uh, one definition that I looked up said it was, like, the ghetto of that area, okay? So Brother Muffy, you know, he was uh, just not having a good, a good go at things. So he goes to live out there in obscurity and basically to just hide for the rest of his life and try to figure things out, all right? So that's where Mephibosheth is, okay? So he's out there for a lot of years. Let me give you the actual definition of what Lodabar means, okay? It means without order. It means disorderly. It means no leader, not governed, rebellious, no shepherd, without pasture, no issue, barren, without speech, dumb, not the word or oracle, false and untrue, no word or no communication. That is the description of the place where he was at. How appropriate for where he was at in his life, yes? He was in a place with no pasture, where nothing was growing. Nothing was going his way, right? And he was living there for years. Um, there, it's unclear exactly how long he lived there. We know it was like at least 12 years, give or take, right? So he's out there. But I got good news. This is not going to be a depressing story. It gets better. Okay? So turn with me now to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Are you guys following along? Bible stories of Pastor Lauren here? Um, I love this. I, I love getting into the word of God. There's so much depth in this. And there's a lot to unpack in this story today. So I'm going to try to speed it up here. So 2 Samuel 9. So at this point, just to give you a little bit of context, mephi has been out, out there out in the wilderness in Lodabar for a long time now, okay? Um, nobody really knows that he's there. He's just living in obscurity, okay? So David has now been established on the throne as the rightful king of Israel. And God anointed him to be in that place. So David was in authority. Somebody say David was in authority. 
All right, put a little pin in that. You need to remember that. David was in authority. He was the anointed king in authority. All right? So David's now in authority, and he's subdued all his enemies. Like, David's got it going on. Everything's going good. All the enemies have been shut up. Everything is at peace. He's got prosperity. He's got peace. He finally had a chance to, like, just kind of sit on the throne and just chill for a little bit, you know? And so in his, like, chilling, this is what happens. And David said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And now the word kindness here, we see kindness and we're like, oh, that, you know, like, who can I, who can I be nice to kind of thing, right? That's like our interpretation interpretation of kindness. I wish, like, if, if there was a superpower I could have, I wish that I could get, like, the Hebrew language, the original Hebrew language just, like, downloaded into my brain. And for all of us, really, so that we can understand because the Hebrew language has such depth in each word. Like, you know, you know, like, I just read that description of Lodabar, and it was, like, five minutes long, and half of y'all, like, tuned me out, like, halfway through. That was for one word, okay? So most of the Bible is like that. Like, we have these one little you know, words that like barely describe the original intention of the Hebrew word. So we get kind of ripped off in the English language. So if you really want to press into the word of God, you got to like, you got to go for it. Okay. So let me give you a description of what kindness actually means, because it doesn't mean like, just like, oh, like just being nice. It's called the kindness of God. And it's called hesed. It's the Hebrew word hesed. And this is the description of that. Wrapping up in itself all the positive attributes of God. It is love. It is covenant faithfulness. Mercy, grace, kindness, loyalty. In short, it represents acts of devotion and loving kindness that go beyond the requirements of duty. So you remember David and Jonathan had a covenant, right? So... David's chilling, but now that covenant is speaking to him because he's like, I'm in covenant with this man, Jonathan. And even though Jonathan is dead, he's like, I have something in me. It's the kindness of God. It's the covenant faithfulness of God. It's undeserved mercy and grace that I need to show to somebody who I'm in covenant with. And Mephibosheth had his father's blood in him, did he not? So, and David's loyalty was to Jonathan, Jonathan, so therefore, by the blood, his loyalty was also to Mephibosheth. But he didn't know Mephibosheth existed. He thought all of Saul's people had been wiped out because that's like, you know, they just all scattered. Some of them probably died. Some of, some of them got killed. Some of them died. Some of them went into hiding. So he said, is there anybody from Saul's house, right, from Jonathan's house? Okay, so, and of the house of Saul, there was a servant whose name was Ziba. All right, this is a key player in this whole story here. So follow me here. When they had called him to David, he said to him, are you Ziba? He said, I, your servant, am he. The king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the unfailing, unsought, unlimited mercy and kindness of God? And Ziba replied, Jonathan has a son, has yet a son who is lame in his feet. And the king said, where is he? And Mephibosheth at this point is like probably like 20 years old, something like that. And he said, where is he? And Ziba said, he's in the house of Makir, son of Am Amiel, in Lodabar. And then the king sent and brought him from the house of Machir, son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold your servant. So David said to him, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore. Somebody say, Restore. Yes, this is the good part, okay? I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, your grandfather, and you shall eat at my table always. And the cripple bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? And then the, the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's son, his, your, the grandson, all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. And you, Ziba, shall till the land for him, you and your sons and your servants, and you shall bring the produce that your master's heir may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, your grandson, shall eat always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. 
Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do according to all my lord the king commands. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, or Micah, whatever you want to say. And all who dwelt in Ziba's house were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, even though he was lame in both feet. So isn't that a powerful story, okay? So let's unpack this for a second, because this is, listen, What's so beautiful about the Bible is that everything in the Old Testament is a parallel and mirrors the New Testament. So if you're tracking, then you can see the parallels here. Can you not? Can you not see how the kindness of God as demonstrated through David to Mephibosheth is the same exact way that God sent Jesus to restore us to the Father? Amen? And when he restored us, he gave us everything. So he takes Mephibosheth, who has nothing, who is nobody, living in obscurity, who's in a very desolate place, has no future, has, had, has lost everything, simply because he was born into the wrong bloodline. And that is the case for you and I. We have been born into the wrong bro- bloodline because we were born into sin. Because the sin of Adam, Adam, the blood of Adam is in us. Hello. And because man sinned, he was no longer worthy of royalty. He was no longer worthy to be in in fellowship with God. Amen. So man was separated from God. Mephibosheth was separated from his inheritance. He lost it because he was born in the wrong bloodline. But thank you, Jesus. The same way David, who was a covenant brother of Jonathan came to restore Mephibosheth to his rightful inheritance. That is what Jesus has done with us. Come on. He's come and he has restored us to our rightful inheritance in God. Amen. In in relationship with God. This is like, it's just the most beautiful story because it so represents what God has done in us. Well, he's, he's taken us from nothing, man. He's taken us from a place where our blood caused, our blood was going to cause our ruin. The blood that we have running through our veins was enough for us to be exterminated because we were born into sin. But the blood of Jesus came and completely superseded that. The blood of Jesus came and the Bible says it doesn't cover sin. It wipes it out. It destroys it. So our blood is no longer the blood of Adam. Our blood is the blood of the second Adam who came to restore everything that the first Adam lost. Amen. So that's the good news. That's like, man, you sit there and you meditate on that long enough. Like we could just pack up and go home now. But we would never... We would never have you get dressed up and come and sit in church just for like 20 minutes. What is that? So there's so much more to this story. Like we're just getting started with this, okay? So y'all just hold on for a second. Fasten your seatbelts. Okay. So that is, that's the first part. And it's so beautiful. Like he got to sit at the king's table. He was now considered just like one of the king's sons. He was treated no differently. And Mephibosheth's coming like, he went from death sentence, from having no future to having everything restored in a, in a day. You, you want to talk about a turnaround. You want to talk about like things are going one way and then they go a different way. That's the goodness of God. He went from having nothing to having everything restored to him. And not just everything restored. Guess what? Now he's got servants. Somebody say servants. Who wants some servants? Listen, we don't know nothing about that here in America, okay? But you live in South Africa, everybody's got, you know, Saudi, you know, everybody's got a servant over there. And um, it's a blessing, you know? You have people, like, that take care of the things, right? So he didn't just get one servant. He got his, um, he got his grandfather's servant, okay? And his grandfather had 15 sons, and then they had 20 servants. So he got a whole house of people now working for him to manage the inheritance that he was given, okay? Now, like, pay attention. Pay attention. Don't let this go over your head. He received a servant to manage his inheritance. Capish? Okay. So, mm, all right, let's go. Let's go to the next part because there's so much. There's so much. Flip over for me. And, baby, whenever you want to jump in, you can. But I, I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll gladly call you up here in a few minutes. Okay, 2 Samuel 16. This is the exciting part. Listen, this story is going to take you on an emotional roller coaster, all right? But I promise it ends, it, 
For us, it ends well, okay? Turn to your neighbor say, it's going to end up good. It's going to get bad, but then it gets good, okay? So, yeah, well, this story doesn't, but we do. So that's the good, that's the good news. Okay, 2 Samuel 16. All right, I don't got time to read all this. Um, gosh. Okay, context. So David's the king, right? We established that. But this is what happens now. David's son, Absalom, y'all ever heard of Absalom? Also not a name on the top of the baby list. Um, He decides, like if you ever meet somebody and they name their kid Mephibosheth and Absalom, there's going to be trouble. So Absalom, one of David's sons, that's a whole other story. We're not going to get into it. But he decides, hey, I want to be king. I want to kick my dad off the throne. Um, he got all these people on his side thinking that's a good plan. And, and there's a whole rebellion that rose up and they were taking over the kingdom. They were literally moving David out of the kingdom, uh, out, of his, out of his place, and they were coming to take over. So there was a rebellion. Somebody say there was a rebellion. I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'm going to give you the, 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 the cliff notes because y'all going to tune me out. So, okay, so there's this rebellion happening, Yeah. David and his family and all his loyal followers, they literally left the palace. That's how bad this rebellion had gotten. And that's a whole other story. But suffice it to say, they had to leave, okay? So they had to leave. And so when David was not on the throne, when David was not in his place of authority, things started to unravel, for brother Mephibosheth, among other people. But this is what happened. So all the people who were loyal with David, they followed David into the wilderness. They're like, we don't care where you're going, but we're loyal to you. You are our king. We're not a part of this because everybody who stayed while the rebellion was happening, if they stayed in place, they were considered loyal to the rebellion. If they went with David, they were considered loyal to David. So David had a group of people moving with him. Now, Mephibosheth wanted to go with David because he's like, that's my king. He's the one who restored me. I'm going with him. So he tells Brother Ziba, he's like, Ziba, give me my donkey. And Ziba, Ziba, that slimy little bastard, he's like, no. He wouldn't give him the donkey. And he left Brother Mephi with his lame feet sitting Home in the palace or wherever he was, okay? So he totally backstabbed him, did not, no longer submitted to his authority, okay? Put a pin in that. No longer listened, Ziba no longer listened to Mephibosheth. He saw this as an opportunity to be greedy and to take all of his master's property, all of his master's inheritance, okay? That was Ziba's plan. So Ziba goes to King David, who's, in, who's running for his life out in the wilderness with his band of loyal followers, and he's like, oh, here, I brought you all these provisions. I brought you all these things to help you in your journey, and he brought him, you know, animals and food and all these things, and, and King David's like, oh, well, this is great. Thanks. But he's like, where's Mephibosheth, you know, your master? And he's like, oh, well, Mephibosheth stayed back there because he thinks that maybe the kingdom's going to come into his hands. So he totally lied. Someone say, Ziba lied. He lied. He lied about Mephibosheth. Okay, he lied. He lied. He stabbed him in the back and then he like twisted it. Okay, so he stabbed Mephibosheth in the back, lied about him to King David. And King David, you know, remember, King David's like, you know, he's in a mess, he's in a mess of trouble right now because he's got his son, you, you know, taking over his kingdom and he's got all these people following him out in the wilderness. And so in that moment, he turns to Ziba and he's like, you know what? You can just have all of his inheritance. Go ahead, take it. Because he believes Ziba. He's like, okay, well, Ziba's loyal to me. Mephibosheth isn't. Fine, you can have his inheritance. That's sad, yeah? This is where the story gets a little sad. But I promise, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get better for you and I. Um, so, so that's where we're at in the story. Now, fast forward to 2 Samuel chapter 19. Again, we're not going to read through all of it right now. I'm going to give you the paraphrased version. But I encourage you to go back through these chapters and read it this week, and it's going to blow your mind. Okay, so 2 Samuel 19, David comes back into power. He comes back into his rightful place on the throne. Brother Absalom got taken out. He got long hair. He got stuck in the trees. It was a whole thing. Um, But you know, the rebellion was squashed, okay? So King David comes back into authority, yes? Okay, he comes back into authority. So he sees Mephibosheth, and he's like, hey, bro, where were you? Like, you didn't follow me. You didn't stay loyal to me. And Mephibosheth was like, no, you don't understand. Ziba screwed me over. He lied about me to you. I was here. I told him to get my donkey. He didn't get my donkey. I couldn't come to you. I got no feet. You know, so he was like, I promise you, I 
that was coming, but he, he messed it all up. Okay, so that's what Mephibosheth had to say to David. And, you know, it's kind of questionable if David believed him or not, because at that point he was like, you know what? I'll restore to you back half of your inheritance, and Ziba keeps the other half. Maybe it's because he wasn't exactly sure of who was telling the truth, or maybe it's because his word had already gone out that uh, Ziba could have his inheritance. So for whatever reason, King David made that decision. And Mephibosheth, in that moment, he was like, I don't even want the inheritance. I don't even want the property. You can let Ziba keep it. I'm just happy that you're back, and you're safe, and you're king on the throne again, okay? And that's the end of the story of Mephibosheth. Let's go, guys. We're done. <laughs> okay. So, unfortunately, that's how it ends for Brother Mephi, okay? Not the greatest story, right? It, like, it started out so beautiful. It started out so powerful. And everybody reads that part of the story. If you've heard other people preach about it, they read that part, and then they just stop there. They don't read the other half because who wants to depress people at church, okay? But we're not going to end there. So, we're going to keep going. Someone say, we're, we're going to keep going. Okay. Now, let's, um, let's shift gears here. Go to Matthew 16, Yeah. This is where it gets to you and me. How many of you know we've been talking about the blessing? Now, let's just talk for a second what the blessing is. What do you think the blessing is? Like if I were to ask you to write down what is the blessing, what are you going to write about? I know what I write about. The blessing is not, you know... If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Like, I'm happy. Like, that's great. But the blessing, really, the best way to describe the blessing, it is our inheritance that Jesus purchased for us. Pastor Alex got into it last week. If you weren't here, you need to go back and listen to it. Because when God put Adam in the Garden of Eve, Eden, what did he say to him? He blessed him. He blessed him. He's like, he imputed his blessing to Adam. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. Adam screwed it up. He lost the blessing. But God then restored it with Noah. Noah gets off the ark, and he gave the blessing to Noah. He's like, all right, now you have the blessing. Be fruitful and multiply. And all throughout history, it was just a story of man messing up the blessing, and then God restoring it to him. And then finally, he's like, these jokers just keep messing it up over and over and over again. I'm going to have to send my son Okay, and we're just going to fix this once and for all. So he sent Jesus to restore the original blessing to us. Amen? Now the blessing is our inheritance with God. It's us being restored to our place in God. Our relationship being restored to God. Amen? And when you're reconciled to God Almighty, you're, you're just like Adam was before the, before the curse of sin came. Hello? Hello? You're now seated with Christ in heavenly places. He's like, I'm going to establish a way that could never be broken. Because there's a sacrifice that is so perfect that nobody, as long as they surrender themselves to the blood of Jesus, that nothing can ever override the blessing of God in their life. Nothing can ever take it away. So he restored to us our inheritance. And you need to sit uh, for a minute, for a hot minute, and consider what that is, the inheritance of God. Let me ask you something. Was there poverty in the Garden of Eden? Was there lack in the Garden of Eden? Was there sickness or disease or depression in the Garden of Eden? Was there any kind of any problem in the Garden of Eden? Was there any kind of curse in the Garden of Eden? Nuh-uh. None of it. And that is the place that we have been restored to. And you, you better recognize. You better recognize what that is for you. Like, because I can sit up here and talk about it all day long, but it can just go whew, right over your head. You're not, even, you're not even tracking with what the blessing is because you just write that off as like a little Christian term. You need to consider what the blessing is. You need to consider what your inheritance in God is. You need to get a hunger of what that looks like for you. You need to get a hunger of finding out what that is in the word of God. Deuteronomy 28 is a good place to start. 
Blessed in the city, blessed in the field. This is God. Like, look, this is my inheritance for you. This is my blessing for you. Pay attention because this is what I got for you. You're going to be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, heading out the tail. You know, all these things, everything you put your hand to is going to prosper. I'm going to open up the windows of heaven. All these things, I'm going to overtake you. You know, all throughout scripture, you're going to see God's revelation of the blessing of his inheritance for you. And the same way King David restored Mephibosheth's blessing, God, through Jesus Christ, has restored the blessing to you. When you become born again, now you go from being in obscurity and darkness to being seated at the king's table. Hello. That's why when it says I'm in Christ Jesus, it means I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. What does that mean? It means my life should look like a Garden of Eden. And I'm just busy going about uh, multiplying and being fruitful and taking dominion everywhere. Hello. Hello. But I'm not here to multiply the curse. I'm here to multiply the blessing. But if you don't get a revelation of the blessing, you're not going to multiply it. If the curse is busy operating in you, then that's what's going to be hindering you from multiplying the blessing through your life. So you've got to have a revelation of what this blessing is. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need a revelation of the blessing of God. Of the inheritance of God. Come on, say, of the inheritance of God. Don't sit here and just hear me talk about it and you not get a hold of it. Because you are called to multiply, but you're called to multiply the blessing. And contrary to popular belief, the blessing is not something you get when you empty your bank account over and over again. Listen, and I'll let him touch on that part later. But we've been groomed to think that I need to break through into the blessing. I need to, you know, do all these things. And I need to um, give so much so that I can be blessed. No, brother, no, sister. You are blessed because of what he did at the cross. You are blessed because of what he purchased for you. The blessing of God is unmerited. You could not earn it. Never. So God's prosperity on your life, God's inheritance for your life is not something that you need to break into. It's something you actually already have. But you need to release it by getting a revelation of the blessing that you carry. And I'm going to tell you, you want to know how you do that? Of course you do. So let's talk about it. Go to Matthew 16. Did you find it? Okay, okay, okay. Matthew 16. Let's go to verse 13. This is, this, this is, okay, this is going to get good. This is where we're going to talk about how to access and release the blessing in your life. Does that sound good? Because you're like, oh, wait a minute, I have this blessing? You mean it's not something I need to earn? It's not something I need to get a hold of? It's not something I need to go out and find? It's not something I need 10 preachers to lay hands on me and anoint me with a bucket of oil so that I can have the blessing too? I don't need to do that. I already have it? Yeah, you already have it. You're sitting on it. But you got to know how to release it. you got to know how to access it. you got to know how to multiply it. Hello? So that's what we're going to talk about now. Here's the fun part, okay? I mean, I'm having fun since I got up here, so... I don't know about you. Okay, verse 13. Now when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they answered, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you yourselves say that I am? Ask yourself, who do I say that he is? Go ahead, ask yourself. Okay. Okay. All right, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Good answer. Then Jesus answered him and he said, blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied are you, Simon, Barjona, for flesh and blood. Men have not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Someone say, brother Peter had a revelation. He had a revelation of what? Of who Jesus was. And where did he get his revelation? From God the Father. He got it. Okay? He got the revelation. Brother Peter got the revelation. And after Jesus said, you got the revelation, this is what he said. I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, 
The powers of the infernal region shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind and declare to be improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, declare lawful on earth, must be what is already loose in heaven. Okay. So Peter had a revelation of who Jesus was. And he got that from God. Because that's where you get your revelation from. And God will use men and women of God to bring that. That's actually our job in the fivefold ministry. It's our job to bring God's revelation to you. But you can get it yourself too. There's so many things that the Lord wants to show you deep in his word. You just got to go with a hungry and an open heart. And that's also our job is to help interpret to you what God's word is saying. Amen. To equip you. To equip you with the revelation you need to operate in this world. Hello. To equip you with your tools. Yes. So we're digging into like a very important tool because we're talking about the blessing and how we have the blessing. But if we have the blessing, the question is, why do I not see the blessing, the inheritance of God that's, that's for me, that I have, I'm seated with Christ. Why am I not seeing it manifest in my life? Why am I struggling with this? Why am I struggling with that? Why can't I seem to get past this thing? The revelation is where it starts. And the revelation comes from God. So many people are busy chasing a method, a model, and a man when their revelation comes from God. So then the method becomes the idol. The breakthrough seed becomes the idol. The do X, Y, and Z to be anointed becomes the idol. The getting hands laid on by this person and that person and that person becomes the idol. And God's like, I'm not trying to reveal myself uh, you know, through some method. Don't let that become the idol. God can do it uh, 10 different ways. I want to reveal myself to you. So put your eyes on me and not on man. He has revelation for you. You need to have a revelation of your inheritance in God. And that comes from him. And when that is on the inside of you, you now have authority. Authority comes out of revelation. A lot of people want to walk around with a bunch of authority, but they don't have revelation. So they have fake authority. Y'all ever met a mall cop before? <laughs> pew, pew. They'll be like, <laughs> or, or like one of your kids, you know, dress up like a police officer, right? And they walk around with their little fake gun and their little badge. And they're like, you know, they want to put you under arrest or whatever. And you're like, oh, that's cute. That's how a lot of Christians are with the keys to the kingdom. They're like, oh, I got all this authority. You're like, you don't got no authority because you got no revelation. You don't even know what you're talking about. But that's where a lot of Christians camp out. They camp out. They want to mimic Somebody else who has the revelation and who carries the authority. And they hear this message. I, I give you the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to bind and I'm going to loose. So I'm just going to bind and loose everything. All the, everything Jesus has for me in my life. And I bind healing. Or I bind sickness and I loose healing. And I, you know, and they walk around and they do the name and claim it thing. And the name and claim it thing is there's an original correct way to do it. But there's a lot of counterfeits and perversions out there of how to make it happen. Okay, that's not, you don't just walk around and just, you know, just shouting stuff and think that that's going to open the windows of heaven over your life. You have the blessing in you, but you access it through revelation and that revelation gives you authority to operate. What does this have to do with brother Mephi and the whole story we just read? Like, where does this come into play? Okay. I'm going to show you. You ready? Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him. I'm just. <laughs> okay. So, Brother Mephibosheth, he had a servant. What's his servant's name? You guys are following along. I'm so proud of you guys. Okay, so he's got Ziba. Ziba's the servant. What was Ziba's job? Listen, this is going to blow your mind. What was Ziba's job? All right, some of y'all stop listening halfway through. Okay, Ziba's job was to manage the inheritance that was restored to Mephibosheth. Okay? That's Ziba's job, to manage the inheritance. When did Ziba get squirrely? When did Ziba go off the walls? When the authority of the king was in question. 
My friends, your ziba is the keys to the kingdom. Your mind and your mouth are the keys that God has given you to unlock the blessing, to cause it to manifest, to steward it in your life. Now, some of y'all that's going over your head, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say it again. The zeba in your life, what zeba represents in your life is the keys to the kingdom that we're reading about here in Matthew. Your mind and your mouth is the servant to manage the inheritance that God has given to you. Your mind and your mouth is the servant God has given you to manage the inheritance he has imputed to you, the blessing he has imputed to you. He's given you the blessing, right? He's restored the blessing to you, just like Mephibosheth had his blessing restored. But now he needs a servant to manage his affairs. He needs a servant to take care of it. God puts an Adam in the garden and he says, here, now you tend it. Now you take care of it. Now you steward it, right? He's given you a ziba. He's given you a servant, and that is your mind and your mouth. That is the keys to the kingdom. But the keys to the kingdom do not work without revelation. The keys to the kingdom do not work outside of authority that you have revelation about. You can talk about it all day long, but until that authority is in you, it's not operating through you. Until you have a revelation of God's authority in you, then those keys are not going to work for you any more than Mr. Mall Cop is going to be able to arrest somebody. You understand? We got a bunch of mall cop Christians trying to arrest people, and they don't have the authority to do that. We got a bunch of Christians quote in scripture that they have no revelation of and they don't walk in the authority of and then they wonder why is it not working I'm speaking I'm saying things I'm saying this I'm saying that and it's not working it's not working because you don't carry the authority behind that revelation or you don't excuse me you don't carry the the revelation behind that authority okay let's bring it home here and then my husband will come up and, and do whatever he wants to do um so, Ziba got squirrely when the authority was in question. This is where people miss it. Because they don't have a revelation of the authority of God in their life. They don't have a revelation, number one, of who God is. Hello. Let's start there. How are you going to operate in the authority of someone that you are not even acquainted with? How are you going to operate in the authority of a king that you don't even know? you got to have a revelation of who he is, number one. Number two, you need to have a revelation of who you are. I am a child of the king. I sit at the king's table. I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's who I am, not because I deserve it or I've earned it, but because it was imputed to me. Through the blood of Jesus. That is who I am. And that is not in question. And I don't want you to just say that. A lot of people just say, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. You need to press in and get a revelation from God what that actually means for you. Because when that is revealed in you, then the authority of God's word is not in question. And then your servant, your mouth and your mind don't have the opportunity to get squirrely. Don't have the opportunity to go start speaking lies and stripping you of your inheritance. This is what happens. People say, oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. I got, I'm the head and not the tail and all that. But then they go out and they, they might be saying that with their mouth. But because it's not revealed to them in their heart, it's just a bunch of mental ascent. It's just a bunch of copying what somebody else said. Because it's not revealed to them in their heart, when they leave and they face the situation that is contesting their inheritance, they question the word of God. They're questioning the authority of the word of God. And when you question the authority of the word of God, your servant, your mind and your mouth is working against you and not for you. It's working against you to steal your inheritance instead of being submitted to the authority of God's word to gain and to release your inheritance. Do you get it? Some of y'all aren't getting it. Let's go again. Let's go again. God's given you 
a supernatural inheritance. It's who you are in Christ Jesus. When that is revealed inside of you, and that is not up for debate. Like, I am seated with Christ in the heavenly places. This blessing belongs to me, period. Period. And there's no circumstance, there's no person, there's nothing that I can see, there's nothing that I can touch or experience that will ever talk me out of who he is and who I am in him. There is nothing that will cause me to question the authority of God's word. If you question the authority of God's word, your servant gets perverted. Your mind and your mouth gets perverted. And it starts spreading lies and those lies rob you of your inheritance. What we are called to do is not end up like Brother Mephibosheth. We've been restored. We've been redeemed. We have the blessing. We're a child of the king. We sit at the king's table. We have access to everything he has given us. But I have to keep my servant in line. Ziba's not going to have a chance to get squirrely on me. Because the, even though David's authority was contested, God's authority is not contested. And that's the good news. That's why our story is different. Because though David's authority was contested and he had to fight to gain back his leadership, he had to fight to gain back his place of authority, God's word is not contested. The Bible doesn't say he's standing next to God. It says Jesus is sitting down at the right hand of God. And he's not moving. He's in his place of authority. And because he's in his place of authority, because he's sitting on the throne, we're sitting right next to him. And we're heirs according to the promise. So my authority in God is not up for debate. The authority of God's word is not up for debate in my life. If the authority of God's word is up for debate in your life, the keys of the kingdom will not work for you. Because the authority is in question. If the authority is in question, the keys aren't going to work. But if the authority is established, then your keys will get to work for you to manage your resources, to manage your inheritance, to manage your God-given blessing. And to release it, to cause it to multiply, to be fruitful. That was Ziba's job, to make the ground produce. That was his job, to be fruitful and multiply. Mephibosheth, here's your guy. He's going to help you be fruitful and multiply. Your mind and your mouth being in an agreement with the authority of the word of God is what causes the blessing to be manifested in your life, what causes it to be multiplied, what causes fruit to be produced in your life. Don't let your mind and your mouth, the binding and the loosing, don't let it get away from you because you question the authority of the word of God. But Pastor Lauren, what about this person? What happened here? What about this failure? What about what this person went through? What about this failure that I experienced in my life? What about this thing that seems to never move? What about this? You're being moved by what you see. Last time I checked, the Bible says we're to be living by faith, not by sight. People live so grounded in the natural realm. You live grounded in the natural realm, you will not experience your heavenly reward. And that's not for when you get there. That's for here. The Bible says your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? That's what it says. Yes? So we're called to manifest that here. But as long as you are moved by your sense realm, you are questioning the authority of the word of God. You need to settle it. And guess what? You can't just settle that with mental assent. It's got to be revealed to you by the Holy Ghost. But it's got to be maintained with a mind and a mouth that is in agreement with the word. You've got to discipline your mind. And if you discipline your mind, you can discipline your mouth. But if your mind starts running off with every thought that comes to question the word of God, then before you know it, your mouth will follow. And before you know it, your mouth is going to start speaking lies. And as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And isn't the tongue like a fire, right? One little flame sets a whole forest on fire. So instead of your tongue being in agreement with the word of God and establishing his authority and his kingdom through your life and his blessing through your life, is busy speaking lies. Oh, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly Jesus. I, I just don't know why. I just don't know why I'm still sick. I don't know why the, these symptoms are just still here. And I, I don't get it. I'm seated with Christ. Your tongue is working against you. And it's because you have not settled the authority of God's word in your life. Settle the authority. you got to get revelation of that authority. You can't just have mental assent of that authority. It's not a hoping that it's going to work. It's knowing. When you have revelation, then it becomes faith to you. Then it's, it's, I don't need to see it before I believe it. I have it. 
I possess it. That authority is mine. That place next to Jesus is mine. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's mine. I don't really care what the circumstance says. I don't care what someone else's circumstance says. I don't care what they went through. I don't care what I went through. I, I consider not. Like Abraham considered not. We need to consider not. Stop considering those things and giving your attention to them. Because when you give your attention to them, you open up the opportunity to question the word of God. And then your mind and your mouth go robbing from you. And instead of multiplying your inheritance, they're robbing your inheritance. We've got we've to get it together. In our minds, in our mouth, in submission to the word of God. Baby, you want to come up here? This is, this is one of the greatest keys. And you hear this preached often. You hear this talked about often. The keys to the kingdom. Whatever I bind on earth shall be bound in hell. Whatever I loose. And so we go about binding and loosing and getting all stirred up about binding and loosing. As you should. But binding and loosing without revelation of the authority is no different than the mall cop. It's no different than your kid walking around with a badge trying to arrest people. You know, I got a really cool visual the other day while he was preaching. And I don't know. I'm a visual learner. Any other visual learners here? Okay. So let's pretend. Use your imaginations. Pretend this is a treasure box. I know it's my Bible, so technically it is. But pretend it's like a treasure box that has like a bunch of little doors on it. And each little door has a key. Yeah? Okay? You track on with me? <laughs> Next time I'll bring a real treasure box so you can really... We can really flow with it. Okay. But you have your treasure box. And it's got all these little drawers. It's got all these little keys. And different keys are going to unlock different parts of the blessing. Now, am I trying to get the blessing or do I have the blessing? I got it. It's mine. I have the blessing. It's mine. But what good is a treasure box that you don't got no keys to? It's just a pretty little box. And that's what we got. We got a bunch of pretty little Christians. I'm blessed and highly favored. And yet their life looks like nothing like that. <laughs> so we don't, we don't want, that's not for us. We want to have it. We want to move the needle. We want to carry God's authority into this earth. Hello. So I have the blessing, but I need to unlock it in my life. So he gives you the keys to the kingdom. The binding and the loosing. But the binding and the loosing, those keys don't work without revelation of the authority. So when you have revelation, you can't just take someone else's keys and use it on your thing. God's got keys for you, and they come when you get the revelation. When you get the revelation of the authority of God in the area of healing, oh, you just got a key. Now you can unlock that in your life. Do you get it? Oh, I just saw some light bulbs go off. When you get the revelation right. of what the authority of God's word says about healing, now you have a key to unlock healing in your life. Did you... Did you go and get healing? No. You've had healing all along. But it wasn't manifested in your life because you never had the key for it. And you never had the key for it because you're busy just borrowing someone else's key. Their key don't work on your stuff. Because their key is theirs because of the revelation they have. I did what they did. They fasted and prayed for 10 days and they got their breakthrough. I, I fasted and, ten, and I'm just hungry. And I'm just cranky. You get the key based on your revelation of the authority of God's word in your life. When you get that, when you understand the authority of God's word on healing, here you go, you got a key. And your key is now getting your mind and your mouth at work to work for you to multiply the blessing in your life. But as long as you don't have that key and you're just pretending you have that key or you're getting a bobby pin and you're trying to like finagle it a different way or you're doing X, Y, and Z, as long as you don't have that and you're just pretending you're just going to be frustrated, beating your box with the key and wondering why it's not working. You can have the keys. Amen? The keys are for you. Amen? He's got a key, and he's got that. And that's why you, you can know some people who they have a great revelation regarding healing. And so they, they walk in divine healing. They walk in supernatural health. You can have somebody else, but maybe that person doesn't have a revelation of financial provision, and they struggle because they don't have a revelation of God's authority in that, of the authority of God's word in that department. So they don't have that key working in their life. You can flip that around. Somebody can have a, a great revelation on prosperity. They understand. They have revelation of the authority of God's word concerning prosperity. So they see that manifested in their life. But maybe they don't have it regarding peace. So they might be provided for, but they're walking around all 
all up in their head, without peace, depressed, all the things. So it's so important that we, that we really get serious about checking, where are the areas that I'm lacking revelation concerning the authority of God's word? What areas of God's word am I questioning his authority? Amen? What areas do I not have a period at the end of that? And start investing your study into that. Baby, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Start investing your study in that because then you give the Holy Spirit something to work with. Amen? And when you give the Holy Spirit something to work with in your life, then that revelation can come. And then those keys can get to work for you. And then you can start multiplying. Amen? Amen? So that's what I had on my heart to share today. I'm going to let him come and wrap it up. And, or not wrap it up, just do the next part. But I'm wrapped up with my stuff. Does that Amen. make sense? <laughs> so, but I had fun with this. I'm glad I got to share it with you guys. And it just, it so goes along with what he's been talking about, about the blessing of God in our lives. Amen? So tag your it. Amen. Everybody go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Come on, you guys are blessed with that? Yes. Come on, give Pastor Lauren a clap here. Just wanted to release her. Amen. <laughs> just loose her on you guys. We did it backwards. We talked in the car. I'm like, let's just do it backwards today. Amen. Mix it up on you guys. Amen. Was that awesome? Are you guys blessed? Everybody say the blessing. blessing. Everybody just close your eyes. Lift your hands right now. I want everybody to just say, Father, Father I, thank you I thank you for a revelation, for a revelation. of your blessing. Lord. I want to tell you, church, God has blessed you, amen? amen? He's blessed you with a blessing. And that blessing is 100% supernatural, amen? amen? So I want everybody to just, just lift your hands and just begin to pray. Say, Lord, give me a revelation. Father, I thank you for a supernatural revelation of the blessing of God. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I thank you, Lord, for your precious Holy Spirit, your presence in this place. Father, I thank you, Lord. Let this word permeate the hearts of your people. Thank you, Lord. I want everybody just to take a, a big, deep breath and exhale. Amen. Say, I'm blessed. Amen. I want to tell you something. 2,000 years ago, Calvary's cross, Jesus already did all the work for you. Amen. You need to learn how to rest in the blessing of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. It's the same blessing that God spoke originally to Adam. Come on, somebody. He said, now go, and be fruitful, and what? Multiply, and what? And subdue the earth. Can I get an amen? 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 So I'm going to wrap this thing up real quick. Before I do that, I want to encourage you about the blessing. Amen? We've been talking about the blessing. Pastor Lauren's getting a revelation on the blessing. Amen? I've been talking about it so much. She's like, she come to me. She's like, man, I tell you right now, the Lord's speaking to me about the blessing, honey. I'm like, well, you need to tell the people about the blessing. Amen. <laughs> amen. Come on, somebody. This blessing needs to get on you. Amen. Tell your neighbor, my, the blessing is on me. There it is. There's the anointing of the Holy Ghost right now. Everybody say, the blessing is on me right now. Oh, it's word activated. Hey, it's blood activated. Come on, somebody. It's the blood of Jesus. Amen. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, then God blessed them. Amen. Every time you see that word in the Bible, you're going to get hit. Amen. With the Holy Ghost. Amen. Everybody said, then God blessed them. Then God blessed me. What he blessed me with, you know. It's funny because people are like, I'm blessed. God blessed me. And then people are automatically thinking about material possessions and material things. The Lord blessed me. What did he blessed me with? He blessed you with the blessing. Amen. Everybody say the blessing. It's the blessing. Amen. It's not just a blessing. Everybody looking for a blessing. Well, what did he give me? 
I'm, the Lord blessed me. What he blessed me with? The blessing. You're like this. If you're like this, you don't know what the blessing is. That's the problem, amen? Come on. You want to get to the root of the problem. If I tell you that you're blessed, and then you're like, okay, what did you give me? Then you got, the, you got a problem. Because that's not the blessing we're talking about. You see, the blessing of God will make you rich. The blessing of God will make you rich. But that's not the only thing the blessing of God does. The blessing of God covers a multitude of sin. Come on, somebody. The blessing of God will make you the head and not the tail. I said the blessing will make you the head and not the tail. The blessing will put you above and not beneath. Come on, somebody. The blessing brings the anointing. Now Now we're talking about You know what I'm talking about? The Bible says if you're favored with unrighteous things, God will entrust you the real riches, which is the blessing. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. Tell your neighbor, that's what I'm talking about. If everything in your life about the blessing has to do with material possessions, you've lost the plot. Amen? We have the blessing. The blessing includes everything. Amen? As a matter of fact, what people call the blessing, God calls the add-ons. He said, first pursue and seek and aim at the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added on. So people make the blessing the add-ons. That's why you don't even understand what you have. That's why you're not walking in the blessing. Because you've made the blessing the wrong thing. Well, the blessing is the farm that I'm believing God for. That's not the blessing. The blessing is that car that I'm believing. You know, I'm just waiting to be blessed. You don't understand who you are in Christ. Are you listening to me? Well, brother, you know, one day, me and my wife, you know, we've just been praying for the blessing. One day we're going to be blessed. See, you don't even understand. You don't understand what Jesus did 2,000 years ago at Calvary's cross. Come on, can I get an amen? Everybody say, the blessing. See, this is the thing. Like, I've been trying to get you to understand this for weeks now. And I, and I know some of you guys are coming full circle. But the, I think even the whole problem is the word blessing. It's so, we've made... That, that word is so loose. Oh, I'm blessed. Oh, I just got blessed. You know, and, and we include, we pack in the blessing of God with everything else that we call blessings. Come on. Amen. Everybody say the blessing is a different thing. The blessing of God is a whole different thing. It's in its own category. You know, it, it would be better if it was a different word. You understand what I'm saying? To separate it. You understand what I'm saying? Because it gets blurry. People start calling the blessing something else. But there is a thing the Bible calls the blessing of God. And it's the original blessing. It's the whole reason God created man. God created man and he blessed them. Amen? Now understand this. The world was, the Bible says, it was without void. It was formless. It was chaotic. It was out of order, right? And then God creates Adam, amen? And he gives Adam the blessing to bring the world into order. Are you listening to me? What was out of order and had chaos, amen, had to be subdued with a blessing, amen? See, when you have the blessing, you're not looking at the chaos. You're looking at what you can do to the chaos. I'm about to bring this chaos into order because I have the blessing. Are you listening to me? So you can't stop people that have the blessing. I'm about to multiply this thing, rearrange this thing. I have authority. Whatever I bind on earth will be bound in the heavens. Whatever I loose on this planet, come on, somebody will be loosed in the heavens. Tell your neighbor, I got the blessing. And God blessed them and said to them, now look at this. It's almost like, it's almost like, you know, you buy something from the store and you have a manual that tells you what it can do, right? Like, you know, if you buy a, if you buy a vacuum, you give it to your wife and you tell her to read the manual. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. <laughs> read the manual, honey. Just want to make sure you know how to use it, right? You know what I'm talking about? We need to get this thing shampooed and cleaned real nice. No, I'm just kidding. It's a joke. Half joking. <laughs> you read the manual, right? And nowadays everything's like got technology, you know? Like, I, you, know, I, you know, the vacuum, you know, can probably get your mail now. I don't know, you know. 
So you read the manual, and the manual begins to tell you what the thing can do. Amen? Well, man has a manual when God created man. Amen? And this is the original intent that God created man for. Amen? And you need to understand that this has been reinstituted back to us because of Jesus. The Bible says there was a first Adam that messed everything up. Amen? And there was a second Adam, his name is Jesus, come on somebody, that made everything right. Amen? So tell your neighbor, here it is. God blessed them and he said to them, everybody say, be fruitful. fruitful. And multiply. multiply. Fill Fill the earth. Subdue it and have dominion. So you are created to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill, subdue, and have dominion. Amen? If you ever wanted to know your assignment. Amen? Now, everybody has a different field to work. Amen? Can I get an amen? Do you know your field? Very important. We talk about this all the time. John chapter 4. Don't say, don't wait and say there's four months and then comes a harvest. The Bible says the what are the what are white? The fields with an S. Amen. Everybody say the fields are white and ready for the harvest. And the reason there's fields is because there are different fields. God's called you into a field, amen. And what you're supposed to do in that field is. You're supposed to go in that field and be fruitful, multiply, fill, subdue, and dominate that field for Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. And now if the church had been doing this for decades now, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in right now. Amen? The, The church of the Lord Jesus Christ forgot the blessing and her original marching orders. Amen? The whole job of this church is to get her back to her original marching orders. Amen? And we're not the only one doing it. Amen? And we're seeing people massively break through. I am so encouraged. I mean, literally every week I'm talking to Lauren. We're sitting at home just, we're so blessed. We're so blessed because, you know why we're so blessed? I'm not blessed because I'm more financially blessed, even though the Lord continues to increase us. But that's not what we're talking about. We don't even talk about that, to be honest with you. You know why we're so blessed week over week? Is because we're seeing people in this church radically break through. Amen? I mean radically break through. And your breakthrough is my breakthrough. Amen? Because when you start getting it, amen, when you start getting it, I know that we can move the needle if everybody gets activated. Amen? What good is it if I'm just activated? We're not doing anything if I'm just activated. Amen? We need to march like an army because there are multiple fields. Everybody say fields with an S. And I'm not called to all of them. Amen? Amen? I have my area of authority, and that's where I dominate, and that's where I multiply. Amen? And I need to empower you to do the same in your area. Can I get an amen? If you're not winning in your area, we don't win collectively. That's why this whole thing has to be a corporate vision, and I've been talking to you about that. If you don't have a corporate vision, you don't have a vision from God because there are no selfish visions. There are no um, individual visions. We're a tribe. Amen? So everybody's got to be connected to their tribe. Amen? Man, this is so good. I got so much, man. We could be here all day, but I'm not going to keep you here all day. This thing is just blowing up on the inside of me. Everybody say the blessing. blessing. Genesis chapter 5, verse 2. Look at this. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind. Everybody say bless them. You see it all over creation. We take it so lightly. So, Terry Neighbor, check this out. The world was in chaos, and God put man in the midst of the chaos, anointed man to bring it into order. Amen? Do you see that in the beginning? Come on, church. Are you tracking with me? The world was in chaos. God anointed man with the creative ability to multiply, to have dominion and subdue, to bring things into order. Amen? 
So then man messes up this blessing. The original assignment was messed up because of sin. Amen? So iniquity came in. Man's will comes in and mess up God's divine order. Amen? And sin corrupted everything so bad that God had to restart all over. Amen? That's the whole story of Noah, right? So check it out. This is pretty interesting. So what did God do with the flood? What happened to the earth? The earth was what? Destroyed. It became formless. It became void of the blessing. Does it sound familiar? Hello? Does it sound familiar? You know, that's why, you know, some people, um, you know, they preach about the, what is it called? The, I forgot the name of it. It's not the antediluvian. It's the, somebody knows what I'm talking about. No theologians in this place? <laughs> the pre-Adamic race, yeah. So people, you know, some people believe in this whole pre-Adamic race theory because they say that God told Adam to replenish the earth. So, so some people say that there was a pre-Adamic race on the planet and, you know, and they messed things up and then God had to recreate Adam. And I'm not saying that's theologically accurate or anything like that. But it follows there is a pattern in scripture where things are messed up and God has to come and use a man, bless him, to bring back order. Amen? So it's interesting how the earth was destroyed. Amen? Again. Formless. Destroyed. Because what happens when you have a wall of salt water? Salt water destroys everything. So let's go to Genesis chapter 8. I want you to see this. Because I want you to understand what you have. Amen? Chapter 8, verse 15. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons, your wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds, cattle, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on earth. And be fruitful. Look at this. What did he tell him as soon as he got off the ark? Amen. Be fruitful and multiply the earth. Well, I don't believe in prosperity. Listen, the original assignment for man was to be fruitful and multiply. That's the original assignment. Think about that, amen? Look at this. Be fruitful, multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his Sons, wives with them. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, whatever creeping on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. <clears throat> Look at this. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and every clean bird and offered a burnt offering, uh, a burnt, uh, offering uh, on an altar. And the Lord smelled a smoothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of a man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed, time, and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. So let's talk about the blessing. Amen. Somebody said, I thought we were talking about it. Yeah, we're talking about it. Let's talk about it. So what came first? Did the blessing come first or the offering? Did the blessing come first or the offering? The blessing came first. Amen? Everybody say the blessing came first. The, came first. the problem with modern day Christianity is this. We are teaching people the offering comes first. And there's a big problem with that. Because when you teach people the offering comes first... The offering doesn't work. Amen? I'm going to share with you a principle today. Because my goal is not to get you to give. My goal is to get you blessed. You have to do it the right way. If you don't do it the right way, you're not going to be blessed. And we don't need your money. Amen? Because God's going to take care of us. Amen? Has and will continue to take care of us. Amen? He's my provider. Amen? Can I get an Amen. 
So I wrote this down today, and I want to make you think. For some of you, it's going to be a little difficult. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. The offering, check this out. The offering is a response to the blessing. If you try to make it any other way, if you, if, you try to get, if you try to make it any other way, you're motivated by mammon. You're not motivated by the blessing. That's how people get the offering messed up. And that's how we prostituted the offering. Because we tell people, how many of y'all want to be blessed? I want to be blessed. My God, I'm struggling to help the Jesus. <laughs> and then we start, and, then, and listen, I believe, I believe when somebody says breakthrough seed, I believe in that statement, but I don't believe in it in the way that some people make it. Because every look, ten different people can say breakthrough seed and mean something different, and change it, and twist it, and blah, 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 blah. it gets weird. Amen. So I don't believe in breakthrough seed when when somebody's like, "Oh my God, I need to be blessed, so I'm going to give in this offering so I can be blessed." <laughs> Sound like the gingerbread man. <laughs> Sound like the gingerbread man from Shrek. <laughs> Don't eat me. <laughs> I'm a real boy. Yeah, yeah. Those are those are the characters I like from that movie. Pinocchio and the gingerbread man. So this is what you got to understand. You got to get a revelation of the blessing. Amen? When you get a revelation of the blessing, what is the blessing going to make you? It's going to make you fruitful and multiply. That's why the Bible says, don't forget the Lord your God. Right? When it's talking about the blessing. When you've built big houses... And you've done all these things. Don't forget the Lord your God, was the, which was the one that gave you the blessing. You understand what I'm saying? When you've grown in great riches. See, because that's the problem. We start getting our eyes on the things. But it's the blessing that causes you to respond to God out of love and worship and honor. And that's how it becomes a sweet-smelling aroma. Because who gave you the sacrifice to sacrifice it? You understand what I'm saying? So offering time is a time when you recognize God for the blessing that he's bestowed upon your life. It comes from a place of worship, not a place of need. Come on, somebody. You make the offering all about need, you're going to miss it. It's no longer a sweet-smelling aroma. Because the offering is the time that you get to thank God for the blessing and the ability to multiply. Can I get an amen? See, now I'm preaching good. It's not a lottery system where you're broke, busted, and disgusted, and you're going to bypass doing things the right way, and you're going to get a shortcut in the front of the line because you gave a big seed. That's not the way it works. Save your money, you're going to need it. Are you listening to me? Do you understand that? Offering time is the time that you say, Lord, you have increased me. You have increased my fruits and my cattle. You've expanded my territory. Oh, God, you're so amazing. You've made me fruitful and multiply. You have given me dominion. So now I set forth this altar to bless you, Lord, because you have blessed me. Offering time is a response to the blessing of God. And when you honor God with what he has blessed you with, God will multiply you and increase you because he can trust you. Because you've not put your eyes on the riches. You understand what I'm saying? Because we bless the Lord, we bless the Lord with what he's blessed us. Look at every offering. God bless man. The first offering that was ever given 
was a response to the blessing. Noah gets off the boat. What's the first thing that God tells him? Be fruitful and multiply with a blessing. And what does Noah do? He builds an altar. The blessing, then the offering. You got you to gotta do it through the blessing. You, it, you, you, you got to stop doing it through this need focus to get something from God. And it's got to be worship. Because not every seed that is given is received. That's the thing that, unfortunately, the church has not been really good at, the, the, the body of Christ has not been really good at teaching believers this principle about the offering. So people think because we give something in a bucket, God is forced to multiply it or God has to receive it. That's not the truth. You can give it in the bucket and God doesn't receive it. You just, get, you just gave it to an organization. Amen? There are offerings that God rejects. Right? All through scripture. Is that true? And there's offerings that he receives. What are the offerings that God rejects when a man's heart's not pure in his giving and his motive is not pure? Are you listening to me? So you have to be very careful for the reason that you give. It's got to come from a place of recognizing that you're thanking God for the blessing in your life. That's the whole point of giving. Thank you, Lord. Because you have made me rich. You've supplied all my needs according to your riches. Amen? Isn't that awesome? Everybody say it's, it's worship. It's worship. Look at this. I'm going to wrap this up. But, I mean, I, I, I love this topic. I mean, I could, just, I could just go on and on and on and on and on and on. That's why, man, it's just. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to get there. That's why the Bible says that a godly man, a man that understands these principles, prepares in his heart. He prepares it beforehand. He doesn't have to be stirred up. He doesn't have to be coaxed into it. You understand what I'm saying? That's why if you're hearing my message, it's very balanced. I'm trying to talk everybody out of giving that's giving with the wrong motive. Who does that? Nobody does that. And I want you to do it the right way. It's got to come from the right heart. Amen? So check this out. Here, let, let's finish this part. So we're in verse, in, in chapter 8. So it gets off, gets off the ark. God reminds them of the blessing. He gives an offering. And check this out. After, because God was the one that delivered them, and then he restores the blessing to multiply and to be fruitful. And Noah's like, you are the one that has blessed me with all of this. And you've given me the blessing to replenish and to multiply. So I'm going to go and bless you out of the blessing. Because how did Noah bless God? From the animals that God brought to Noah. Are you listening to me? The increase that God brought to Noah was how Noah was ever able to bless God. So we bless God off the increase that the blessing brings upon our life. Can I get an amen? And because, God, because man was willing to honor God in that way, God made a covenant with man and said, man, that sacrifice that you've made was a sweet-smelling aroma. That worship, Amen. Pleased the heart of God so much that God made a covenant with Noah and said that he would never destroy the earth again over an offering. Isn't that powerful? Offerings do move the heart of God when they're done the right way. Because it's an honor and worship thing. Amen? Just like last week I was, I was telling you the original definition of the word love in Hebrew. Amen? So it, Ancient Hebrew is called Paleo Hebrew. It's the original language that the Bible was written in. Amen? And the original word for love in Paleo Hebrew is broken down into three words. And the, word, the first word is to give. So to love means to give. And then it says, and then the second word that defines love is the breath of God, the life of God. And then the third word that defines the love of God is 
is a shelter or a home, a place where you can be taken care of. So think about it. What did Jesus do for us when he died on the cross? The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave. Amen? He gave us his only begotten son to give us his breath of life. Come on, somebody. The second word. To go to heaven and prepare a place for us. Amen? Isn't that amazing? So love always gives in response. Amen? Because you can't give with love unless you've been loved first. So God comes in and he loves you and he blesses you with a blessing. And then you respond. Are you listening to me? By giving back to him. Isn't that awesome? That's the beautiful exchange. Everybody say uh, Genesis 9. We're going to Genesis 9. Look at this. So they get off the boat. So God blessed his sons and said to them. So he, he comes and he just re reminds them again. God blesses Noah and his sons and he says to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth. So that's dominion again. There it is. Same thing he spoke to Adam. There's that dominion. There's that authority. Everybody say it comes with the blessing. Isn't that awesome? And so you see throughout Scripture, God reinstituting and cutting covenant with, with men pertaining to the blessing. Amen? One of the things that he does later on is he gives men the ability to bless others. Amen? He's like, I want, okay, he's like, now I want you to be like me. Everybody that blesses you will be blessed. And whoever you pronounce blessing over will be blessed. So God will give you the authority to bless. Amen? Come on, somebody. This is where we get impartation from, by the way. We receive impartation from God. God will give an impartation to a man, and that man can take that impartation and speak it over somebody else. Amen? Look at this. Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a what? A blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be what? Blessed. God giving man the ability to pronounce blessing over others. Amen. It's called delegated authority. And it still exists on the earth, amen? The Bible says God gave gifts to men, and he gave gifts to men in the form of men, amen? So God anoints people, amen? Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. When Abraham was 90 years old, the Lord appeared to him, to Abraham, and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between you and me, and I will multiply you, what? Exceedingly. Amen? Everybody say, God's blessing for my life is to multiply me exceedingly. So you already have the blessing. That's what Pastor Lawrence is trying to encourage you. Last week we talked about the same thing. People trying to give in the offering, trying to get the blessing. No, 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 no. You have the blessing. Now go be fruitful and multiply. And when you are, when you take the blessing of God and the anointing that God's put on the earth, and you go out there and multiply, you're going to be overwhelmed with the blessing of God, and you're not going to be able to take credit for it. You're going to be like, my God, hold on a minute. This is surely the blessing of my Lord. And you will get on your knees and offer a sacrifice to the Lord and say, thank you, Jesus, because I know it's your blessing on my life. It's not my ability, but it's your ability. We respond out of his abundance because of the blessing. Do you have it, church? My Lord. 
And the cycle never stops. You can't outgive God. You just can't. Then Abraham fell on his face and talked, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall be Abraham. Amen? We've been talking about it, how let God make you. Amen? God will make you whatever he wants to make you. Get over your excuses. Amen? God made a shepherd boy the king. Who made the shepherd boy the king? God made him. Amen? The Bible says if you're faithful with the little, God will what? Make you rule over much. Amen? What's your excuse? You have no excuse. God will step up in your situation and make you whatever he wants to make you. Can I get a shout in this place? Come on, somebody. If that doesn't give you boldness, I don't know what will. Amen? Tell your neighbor, God's about to make me something. I don't know. You got to figure out what it is. Amen? But God made Abram Abraham. He made him the father of many nations. Amen? Amen? See, our devotion to God is because of his goodness. I was broken, and God made me victorious, so I give him praise. You understand what I'm saying? I was broke, and God exceedingly blessed me with abundance. Amen? So I recognize him out of the abundance, and I honor him back. We respond to the blessing. That's what you need to do. You need to recognize you have it. You can't earn it. It's unmerited through the blood of Jesus. You need to act on that blessing. You need to begin to multiply the blessing. You need, to be, you need to begin to subdue some things, multiply some things. Amen? And when you recognize that you have it, it'll work on your life. Amen? And when it works, it'll be so overwhelming, so abundant, that your response will be to want to honor God with your substance. Lord, everything comes from you. All of this came from your hands. Surely it's the Lord thy God that has blessed me. Man, that's good. I get it all over again every time I preach it. Amen. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Amen. Well, you need to get all over all. You need to get over all that. I don't believe any of that. I believe this. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Well, pa well, Pastor Alex, it's not talking to you, it's talking to Abraham. See, you don't know your Bible. The Bible says the covenant that he made with Abraham is our covenant. Come on, somebody. This is, he's talking to me. Whatever he says to Abraham, everybody says, whatever he says to Abraham, he's saying to me. Because that's the covenant that God cut. The Bible says we're heirs according to the promise that God made Abraham. Can I get an amen? amen. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make, I will make nations of you. And kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between you and between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant. That's us. Everybody say us. We're part of that everlasting covenant in those generations that's being prophesied. To, to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also to give you and your descendants after you in the land which you are strangers in all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Okay, we're going to wrap this up. Just got to get this in here. Galatians chapter 3, verse 7 and 14. If you want to go back and read that, just write it down. Heirs according to the promise that God made Abraham. Don't forget it. You got to know your blessing if you want to enforce it. Stop trying to earn your blessing with an offering. Take your blessing and multiply and you will multiply so much that your re automatic response will be to want to honor God with everything that you have because everything's going to come from him. Amen? See, when you don't, when you're giving out of need, you're always stingy and you will always hold back because it's not supernaturally multiplied. Are you listening to me? I don't think you're listening to me. Let me try to help you. If I have a limited supply of water, I'm going to ration my water when I give it. Is that true? Come on, guys. Come on. Let's go back to kindergarten here. Everybody with me? If I have a limited supply of water, I'm going to ration it when I give it out. Is that true? If I have an unlimited supply of water, I will not ration it. 
Are you listening to me? You will give with reckless abandonment. Amen? Why? Because you're not trying to get the blessing. You're not trying to get a revelation of the blessing. You know that you have the blessing. Come on, somebody. I got to get the faith on me for somebody who's going to get this today. That's how I operate. I have this blessing. You understand what I'm saying? So that's why I give and I respond the way I respond. Because it's unlimited. You can't outgive God. You understand what I'm saying? I do it from my personal account, from the ministry account, from every account, every account that we have. You're on notice. You know what I'm talking about? Because we're going to give, amen? Why? Because it's never ending. The blessing is with me. Are you listening to me? See, if the blessing is with your bank account, then what happens when the bank, what happens when the banks fail? There grows your blessing. When the blessing is with you, you can't fail. You got to understand that. You got a chip on your shoulder. It's not about currency anymore. It's about the blessing. Are you listening? It's not about materialism anymore. It's about the blessing. This blessing works. It works in Africa. It works in Brazil. It works where there's banks, where there's no banks. Are you listening to me? You have a supernatural ability to multiply when you have the blessing. You have a supernatural ability to be fruitful when you have the blessing. People are looking at giving the offering to get God to solve a problem that the blessing has already taken care of. You're trying to earn what the, you're trying to earn what Jesus purchased for you 2,000 years ago at Calvary's cross to give you the blessing. You need to recognize what you have. When you recognize what you have, you're going to begin to walk in it and you'll begin to multiply and your increase will be so ridiculous that your natural response will be to overwhelmingly want to thank God with your giving. Can I get an amen? That's how you give. Can I, come on, give Jesus a shout in this place. Isn't this good? Let's go to Deuteronomy 28. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I have commanded you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Now this is the prophecy of what has to happen before Jesus comes. Amen? Amen? This prophecy is not just for that generation, but it's even more so for our generation. Can I get an amen? Amen? Because the Bible says the glory of the latter house should be greater. So if anyone should, if there's a generation that's going to walk in this blessing, it will be the last generation before Jesus comes. Are you listening to me? So I know everybody wants to tell you Jesus is going to come. He's not going to come until this is completely fulfilled, over the top, with abundance, and we're dominating. Are you listening to me? Jesus coming back for the church is not God's bailout system because we're so broken. Amen? We're going to be hurting the devil. We're going to have our foot on the devil's neck so hard that he can't do anything. And unless we be removed, he can't take over. That's hot. That's, come on, somebody. Amen? So understand, are you excited? Because we're about to see it. I believe we're going to start seeing the tide change in our generation. Amen? Are you listening to me? How much can be done in one generation? That's really the question. How much can we actually change the tide? Because we have the blessing. You just got to stop trying to get it. I'm going to say it again. You just got to stop trying to get it. And you've got to get the revelation that you already have it. It's different. See, if you're trying to get it, you never get started. Well, you know, I'm just waiting to be blessed, and I'm going to do what God's called me to do. Well, I'm just waiting, you know, for this thing and waiting. You know, I'm just waiting, waiting, waiting. Procrastination. The Bible clearly tells you don't wait and say there's four months. Well, you know, in, in, in a couple months' time, I'm going to be blessed, and then I'm going to go do, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go into the harvest field. You know, I'm just waiting a couple months, you know, for my blessing to come in. 
Let me give in this offering so I can get a blessing. No, 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 no. Bad doctrine. You're blessed right now. You're never going to be more blessed than you are right now. If you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So I want everybody to renew your mind about what you call the blessing. Well, I'm just, you know, we're just waiting for this blessing. Imagine it from God's perspective. God looked in his eternal heavenly treasury. I mean, think about how far God has to look. You know what I'm talking about? Does everybody have an imagination? Just want to make sure. Okay, let's start that over again. God looked in his eternal heavenly treasury. Do you see it, people? Say, say amen. amen. Say, I see it, Pastor Alex. I, I have an imagination. Do you see the treasury? It's eternal. That means it never ends. Do you see it? So God looked in that eternal treasury. And it was not sufficient. None of this eternal treasury can define how much I love my creation. Come on, somebody. Oh, Jesus. He could have given it all. He could have given us all the eternal treasury of what people think treasury is. But he looked at it and he said, no, it's not enough. It does not define my heart. And he, and he, and he looked at his right hand and he saw his only son, his most prized treasure. And he gave us his very best. Come on, somebody. Do you know how much God loves you? Do you know how much he loves you? I mean, think about it. Fort Knox cannot compare. It was not enough. He could have gave you a bunch of material stuff. That was not enough. That was not valuable enough. He gave you his most valuable possession. The most valuable thing to him. His only begotten son. God gave you his firstborn. His only begotten. Jesus is the firstborn of many sons being brought to glory. Imagine that. Imagine you giving somebody your firstborn to tell them how much you love them. And that's why the Bible says if he, if he gave us Jesus, how much more will he freely give us all things? And we put our focus on all the things, which are the add-ons. Who cares about all those things? You have Jesus. Come on, somebody. You have Jesus. Jesus bought and purchased for you the blessing. My Lord, get a revelation today. So you're never waiting to be blessed. You can add a hundred million dollars, and in the light of eternity, it does not move the needle to how much you're blessed. Because that means nothing. You can't be more blessed. You'll never be more blessed than you are right now. If you gain some money and you start thinking, I'm more blessed now, you never had a revelation of what you had. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're like, well, now I'm going to be happy and now I'm going to get my attitude straight and now I'm going to stop complaining because I got a couple dollars in the bank. It just goes to show you how much money and, and material possessions are an idol to you. Are you listening to me? When you have a revelation of what's been given to you, you begin, you know, you know what's the response to that? The response to that revelation is worship and praise and honor. And I believe the reason why people don't worship God and they don't give them praise is because they don't know what's been purchased for them. They're trying to get some material things that are insignificant. When you've already been given God's best, that's where worship comes from. You wake up every single day, you look in the mirror, that man is blessed. I can't be any more blessed. Now take that blessing and go do something with it. Come on, church. Will you do that? I think we're getting somewhere today. Amen? Terry, never take that blessing. This is the blessing. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. You shall be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, in the country. You shall be, you shall, blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds. 
the increase of your cattle and your offsprings and your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Listen, because you are blessed, everything you possess is blessed. Amen? But it only works if you believe it. Faith, the purpose of faith is to activate the blessing. That's what faith does. When you begin to act on the word of God, it activates the blessing of God on your life. Amen? You know the story. You can go back and read it. Some of you need to go back through this over and over and over and over again until you renew your mind. Unfortunately, we all know people that are miserable because they don't have money in their bank account. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a Christian that does not have a revelation of the blessing of God. Amen? Your bank account should not move, should not tell you whether you have peace or joy. You have peace and joy because Jesus purchased for you 2,000 years ago at Calvary's cross. Can I get an amen? Don't ever make that mistake ever again. Amen? I'm blessed. When am I blessed? Every single day that I wake up, his mercies are new every single day. This is what we forgot to tell the church, I think. People are waiting to do something. Now, I don't have time to read this today. I was going to go through it today. I might go over it next week, but I'll, I'll give you the... I'll give you the verse so you can be prepared for it for next week. Go to Deuteronomy 33. You can read it when you get home. Amen? In Deuteronomy 23, before, right before God takes Moses home, amen, which was an epic thing in 34, the way it, the whole thing happened. You know, God, God tells Noah to meet him up at the top of the mountain, Moses. So, he, you know, God's with Moses at the top of the mountain, and he said, there it is, the whole thing I promised you, and your children will walk into it. And I remember I told you, you weren't going to see it. You weren't going to enter in, but he got to see it and not enter in. This is God talking with Moses on top of the mountain. And the Bible says that Noah breathed his last breath right there with God, Mo Mo Moses. The Bible says that God actually buried Moses himself. To the point where nobody knew where his body rested. Bro. <laughs> Read it, 34. Now, uh, Moses was 100 years old when he climbed the mountain. So remember when God spoke a blessing over him that he would be strong? Amen. I mean, imagine, you know, that mountain, I, I think the elevation on it, I looked it up. Um, mount Sinai, somebody can look it up right now. I forgot about the elevation on it. What is the mountain? Amen. He climbed the mountain. Gets up there. God shows him the whole thing. 7,000 7, feet elevation. Imagine climbing a 7,000 foot elevation mountain all by yourself. You're 100 years old. Amen. Come on. That's what I'm believing God to do. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you. I haven't lost a step. And if you think, if you think I lost a step, I'll race you after service. I'll tell you right now, you're going to get a revelation. <laughs> hey, I don't know what you believe. I know what I believe. It just so happens it works. Catch me on the basketball court. Some of you need to change the way you believe. You need to speak to your body. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in me to quicken, make alive my mortal body. Amen? So I'm being restored, regenerated every single day. Amen? That's my blessing. I don't know about you. So verse 33, I'm giving you a lot today, but we're talking about the blessing, amen? And when we talk about the blessing, the blessing is just too much. It's just, it's just all over the place. You know what I'm talking about? You begin to pour it out, it gets all over the table. It's just over the top. You know what I'm talking about? So I'm giving you some blessing, amen? Just pouring it everywhere. You're like, oh, my God, so much. <laughs> amen? <laughs> That's how the blessing is, amen? So verse 33, for those of you that want to study the word, all 1% of you, 33, you, you go in here and you see that God took men, he gave them authority to pronounce blessing. Amen? That is a real thing. Amen? That's why I believe it's important to be a man that's under authority. Amen? 
because authority is always delegated. Nobody in the Bible had authority unless it was delegated. That's why we have ordination. Amen? Ordination is not just papers. People go and get a little certificate, and I'm ordained, you know? You're ordained by man, but you're not ordained by heaven. That's a whole different thing. Remember, God established a five-fold ministry to be the leadership of the church. God established it. Amen? And he's called all of God's people to come up under the five-fold to be equipped. Now, if you're like, oh, I don't need the five-fold, it's fine. You're, you, you might make it to heaven, maybe. But you're not going to have your equipment. Because the Bible says the way you get equipped is through the fivefold. Amen? So when we're talking about the blessing, we can get into all kinds of things. God pronounces blessings, special blessings over people. Amen? There's the fivefold ministry. And that fivefold ministry delegates, amen, and imparts that blessing. You see the Apostle Paul saying, stir up the gift of God, which was on you by the laying out of my hands. Amen? Are you listening to me? So that is, is a real thing. Amen? And you see it from the beginning. Moses, before he dies, he calls all the tribes... And he pronounced a blessing over every single tribe. He releases everything God deposited in him so he can leave this planet empty. Oh, my God. Amen? And that's what a real man of God does. A real man of God empowers others. Are you listening to me? He takes what God's put in him and he multiplies it into a generation to empower them to do what God's called them to do. Mm. So you can go read that. It's powerful. Because he gets specific. Amen? I believe there's a lot of people that are not in the pocket of what God's called them to do because they're not, they're not in spiritual alignment. How can two walk together unless they be in agreement? You've got to find that agreement place where God wants you. Amen? It's very, very, very important. Amen? So you can go read that for yourself. Amen? Because that is an important part of the blessing. Can I get an amen? amen. If you want to read a little bit more about that, and this is all stuff I was going to talk about today, you can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And it's the Apostle Paul defending his authority to the church, saying why he has the authority that he has. Amen? And he specifically says in there, if you go back and says, he says, listen, the reason I have authority over you guys is not because I chose to have authority over you guys. It's because God put you guys under my counsel for me to raise you up. So he goes off and he says that. Amen? So there is, listen, when the Bible says don't forset the gathering of the saints... The Bible has corporate gatherings of saints, amen? And you need, everybody should find their corporate gathering, amen? So that we could be spiritually aligned where we're supposed to be, amen? Because that's important, amen? That is a part of your blessing. Because a part of you being released is you being under the ministry you're supposed to be under, amen? Can I get an amen? There was 12 tribes, each had a specific assignment. Is that true? Yes. Amen? And it's just like the body of Christ, amen? You have different churches. You have different camps that focus on different things. They have a revelation. They focus on healing. These, and, and it's not that everybody doesn't preach all the word of God. We all preach all the word, but there's different graces. Can I get an amen? But that's just some cliff notes, amen? Let's close it out here today, amen? Are you ready for this? We're going to close it out. Everybody go 2 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> and all of this stuff is amazing because all of it, the whole word, it confirms itself. It's all interconnected. Amen? And it's not just one thing. We have to allow the word of God to counsel us into God's will. Amen? Can I get an Amen. And when we do that, we have the blessing. And when you have the blessing, you can't fail. Amen? Look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read from the top. Now concerning the ministering of the saint, it is superfusilish, superfusilish for me to write to you. For I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians. That Akai was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. <clears throat> and yet I have sent the brethren, lest your boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready, lest some of you Macedonians come and find you unprepared. We, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. So the Apostle Paul is boasting about 
a church that was very zealous in their giving. So he sent them to another church, basically, to counsel them to, so that they can get a revelation and be ready with a gift. Isn't that amazing? And he said, the reason I'm doing this is because if I come and you're not ready, it would be embarrassing that you don't have a gift. Amen? And that is a principle. Amen? And that's a principle I follow with my spiritual authority. Amen? Amen? We're very generous. I'm very generous to my, to my covering. Can I get an amen? Because I understand this principle. And I can't wait to give. Amen? It's like the most joyous thing. Amen? Are you listening to me? And I don't give to Pastor Rodney because I don't, give Pastor, I don't give to Pastor Rodney and I don't honor him, his ministry, because it's, my, it's a good idea. Like, oh, you know, well, he's a real, he, you know, it makes sense because he's such a general in the body of Christ that I should give to him. And you shouldn't give like that. You got to give where you're spiritually aligned. Amen? You give, you give in the place that God has placed you. Are you listening to me? So if God's given you a spiritual covering, that's where you give. Amen? But what people do is they're always giving. People are always giving for leverage. And leverage does this. Leverage says this. Let's say God put me under you. You're my spiritual authority. But then I find somebody that's more anointed than you in the natural. Well, you know, you're just Saudi. I mean, praise God, but you're just Saudi. But this guy's a general. So I'm going to give to the general and bypass my spiritual covering to give to the general because I perceive that I can get more from him. That's not spiritual authority. That's not the way it works. Amen? Are you listening to me? Everybody should give. The Bible says a workman is worthy of his wages. Amen? And when the Bible talks about giving and the tithe, the tithe goes to the priest that is represented in your region. Amen? The Bible says the priest collected on God's behalf. Amen? And that priest is different for everybody because everybody has a different gathering of the saints. That's the way the tithe actually operates. Amen? You give where you're planted. Amen? Because the only reason, think about it, if we're giving to God, how many guys want to give to God? You want to give to God. So who are you giving to? Are you giving to man or are you giving to God? So if you're giving to God, you have to do it God's way. See, when you start giving to man, that's when we start adding logic to it. You understand what I'm saying? Well, you know, I know you're my spiritual authority, but he's more anointed. I perceive he's more anointed. You understand what I'm saying? If it was like that, then nobody would ever give to the local church. Everybody would just say, you know, we would have a list, a top ten list of who's the most anointed, and everybody would just give to them. You understand what I'm saying? But that's not the way it works. Because when he's talking about going to this church, and they gave, amen, because Paul started that church. That's the spiritual authority. Amen? And he saw that this church didn't have a, re a revelation, so he told this congregation, go and encourage them about giving because they don't, get a, they don't have a revelation. You understand what I'm saying? Because if I come and they don't have a gift, it would be embarrassing. That's how they thought back then. People think that offering messages nowadays are strong. Back then, they said, listen, the Apostle Paul's like, man, if I come in town and they don't have an offering, it's embarrassing. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> I'm embarrassed for you, so... I don't want to get embarrassed, so I'm going to go and have somebody set the expectation for you. Isn't that crazy? Now, that, with that being said, you have to, I qualified the whole thing even before I started. You give to the Lord. You give to honor and worship God. You don't give to get. Amen? The fact that God multiplies your seed, yes, we have faith that God will multiply our seed, but that's not the primary motivator. The primary motivator is to honor God with your substance. Can I get an Amen. Look at this. Lest some of you Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared. We not mentioning, not mention you necessarily to exhort the brethren to go ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity, not grudging obligation. Isn't that powerful? But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he has purposed in his heart, 
not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I will say this, you need to be wherever you put your finances because that's where your heart's going to be. I believe people's hearts are divided because they give here and then they're trying to connect over here. And so your heart's all divided and it's all wacky. It's all out of whack because you can never be in covenant with a ministry unless you're giving into that ministry. I'm just telling you right now. So you need to be where you give. If you believe enough in that ministry to give into that ministry, that's exactly where you need to go to church. Amen? Are you listening to me? Because that's actually where your heart is. Because somebody can say this. They can say, well, you're my pastor. Somebody can say, you're my pastor. Oh, you, you're my pastor. I know that you're my spiritual covering. And I know that God brought me under you. But I'm going to give over here. Now you're lying. Because the Bible says your heart, where's your heart? Where your treasure is. So you're not even saying the truth. Amen? And I think a lot of times people do that because they're trying to double dip or they're trying to circumvent or they're trying to leverage. They're like, well, you know, I know you're my pastor, but I get more of a return because I believe this man is more anointed. That's not the way it works. It's not logic. It's spiritual authority. And if you can't be a soldier and follow spiritual authority, then you're out of whack. Amen? I know where my giving goes because I know who my pastor is. Amen? You need to know where your church is. You need to know where you're planted. And that's where your heart needs to be connected with your gift. Are you listening to me? Does that make sense? And when you do it that way, you will give with a willing heart. Amen? Does that make sense? It's the same reason why people go to different ministries. They're like, you know, um, you know I'm going to serve you, but I'm not looking for my impartation from you. And they go bounce around, fly around the, the country looking for the man of God to lay hands on them so they can somehow get an impartation. You know what I'm saying? Your impartation is going to come where God's planted you. Because your impartation doesn't come from a man. It comes from God. And God uses people. Yes, he does. But ultimately, the reason why you're qualified is because heaven qualified your heart. And God is the one that releases it. Are you listening to me? So a lot of this flaky stuff that goes on is all about leverage. It's all people leveraging, like back-channeling, leveraging, trying to circumvent, trying to get a shortcut. There is no shortcuts. Amen? Let me ask you something. How many men did Kenneth Hagin lay hands on? How many Kenneth Hagins do we have in this generation? Amen? One of the main things they say about the old generals is where, where are their spiritual sons? Huh? Hold on a minute. I'm going to say it again. One of the things that's being said in this generation is where are the spiritual sons of the giant to set the course for us to stand on their shoulders today? Where are they? Huh? People don't understand impartation. People play games. They want to, oh, well, you know, you know, like, you know, somebody's, you know, serving T.L. Osborne. And he's like, well, I know T.L. Osborne's a man of God. And then they, somebody comes in as a guest speaker and they're like, well, hold on a minute. He might be more known than T.L. Osborne. Well, let me see if I can get his number. And then start networking that guy and then start going to his camp meetings and, and, and then, you know, sitting at the edge of the seat like, oh, man, if he can just pour a jar of oil over me, I know my God, I'll be ready to go. People are ridiculous, bro. And it's just a bunch of worshiping men. People don't want to actually line up and follow spiritual authority. It's all just these men of opportunity. And I'm telling you right now, somebody can, somebody, some, an anointed man of God can, can anoint you with 500 gallons of oil. And if it, God's not in it, then it doesn't mean anything. You just got wet. You're just slimy now. Let me ask you this. How many guys have ever seen somebody get oil poured over their head? Amen? And how many of you guys saw those people do great things for God? <laughs> I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying that God's not in it. God's in it if God initiated it. And if the person is being faithful, there's the qualifiers. Amen? But people are trying to play these games. I'm not saying that none of this stuff. I'm not saying, look, if God told me to pour a gallon of oil over somebody's head, guess what I'm doing? I'm going to do it. You know what I'm saying? But I'm going to do it because God said it. Well, what happens if I wake up one day, and you don't know it, you don't know it, I could be off one day. i am be like, you know what, I think it's a good idea, I'm going to pour a gallon of oil over one of my disciples' heads. And I just missed it. But I promise you right now, I promise you right now, people are so desperate for affirmation that even if I did it in the flesh, 
the person that would be getting the oil poured over them, they'd be crying like, oh, God. Oh, and it's totally God's not even in it. I'm just telling you. Because people are so desperate to be special, to be singled out, to be called out by the man of God. Be careful with that. Listen, if you're desperate for that, it just means you don't honor the Holy Ghost. You need to be desperate. Listen, you're so desperate for a man of God to call you out, lay hands on you. You know you have the Holy Spirit, and you can go in your prayer closet and meet him every single day. You got an idol, my friend. You got an idol. And that's not the way it works. So there's a balance to all this stuff. But it all starts with you get a revelation of the blessing. Get a revelation of the blessing. Do what the Lord tells you to do. Line up where God has you lined up. Amen? Be a soldier, be a stone in God's house. Amen? If I'm playing, can you guys give me a couple of Bibles? Give me like four or five Bibles. Just put them over here. The Bible says we're living stones in God's house. Put that Bible there. If we're living stones in God's house, this is what God does. He's building a house. Is he right? He goes and he, this is you. And he puts you over somebody. Amen? Then he puts somebody over you. And you're like, oh, I don't like that. Mm. I don't want to be under that stone. Well, you know, you know when the Bible says, can the clay tell the potter? And what is bricks? Bricks are clay. We get put under authority and we're like, I don't want to be under that guy. I think I'm better than him, or I think I'm more anointed than him. And then so God puts somebody else. He's like, no, I want to actually be over him and over this guy. That's actually where I want to be. <laughs> that doesn't require humility, right? <laughs> I want to be over everybody on top. <laughs> that right there. Now I'm blessed. Now I feel blessed. Amen? But you know, people that are like that, they don't recognize that the, what the Bible says is that the, God, the people that God actually likes are the people that want to go lower. They want to uplift others. Everything's about going lower in the kingdom. That's how you become number one. By lifting up other people. Come on, can I get an amen? You can play games. You can play games in the natural, but you can't play games in the light of eternity. Amen? I want everybody to prepare their seed today. And I want you to give with your heart. How many believe in the blessing? You believe that God's given you the anointing to multiply? Do yes. you believe it? Yes. Now respond. Amen? Today. And say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the ability to multiply. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Man, I'm just going to tell you, the Lord's been good to us. Amen? Every part of this build out, we've been able to do it debt free. We put about a million dollars in this property, debt free. We owe nothing to the bank. We're just getting started and we owe nothing. Amen? Come on. And we're going to finish everything completely debt free because we have the blessing. Can I get an amen? Amen? And you have the blessing. You have everything that you need to go and dominate. Are you listening to me? But you need to be in your place. You need to be where God pitch, places you, amen? Not looking for anything else. I don't want anything else. Pastor Roddy doesn't have to be my pastor. You understand what I'm saying? I didn't choose that. The Lord chose Pastor Roddy to be my pastor. So this period at the end, I'm not looking for anybody else. Like, I don't go to camp meeting. Pastor brings in a guest speaker, and I'm like, well, man, that, I, man, my heart's starting to change now. I'm just, I really feel, <laughs> no, no. I'm like, no, that was a great word. But I, I know who my pastor is. That's the bottom line, amen? Come on. We don't have that kind of loyalty anymore. That, the whole body's divided. Everybody does whatever they want. Leverage, do this, do that. Network, uh, shortcut, uh, circumvent, do this, do that. Jump around, hop around. Don't do any of that. Be rooted and planted somewhere. If you want to grow, amen? And you want to do something that moves the needle in the kingdom of God, we got to come together, amen? And listen, I want to tell you this right now. If there are people in this place, you come to this church, and I'm not your pastor, you need to stop coming to this church. I'm just telling you right now. Amen. If you're brand new and you don't know anything about Christianity, you need to pray and ask the Lord if this is your church, if I'm your pastor. Amen. And if I'm not, I will help you find. You can come to me and I'll be like, 
be like, you know, I've been coming to this church, but I just really feel this is not my church. You know, I love you, but don't really feel like you're my pastor. And I'll find you, I'll help you find another church. Amen? Amen? But find a place. Amen? But I believe there's people coming to this church and they're like, no, well, Pastor Alex is not my pastor. Well, you stop coming to this church. Amen? I'm just telling you right now. You need to find, wherever your heart is, that's where you need to be. Amen? Because I'm not looking to shepherd somebody else's sheep. I don't have grace to shepherd somebody else's sheep. I'm not looking to take anybody out of any flock. Are you listening to me? You need to be, I'm telling you before the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is on you. It's between you and God. You need to be exactly where God wants you to be. And that's all that I want. And I'll tell you this, for everybody that runs a business, you need to run your business the same way. Your leadership team, the corporate structure of your, of your company, there are people that are called to those places and positions. Are you listening to me? And you need to have the right people in the right places. Amen? And you can't overesteem your value and undervalue the people that God's brought you. You need to recognize if God's brought you a gift, that guy has the anointing to carry that, that office. Are you listening to me? And if you just fire him and replace him with somebody else, you might be replacing him with Absalom. Amen? And that's the problem. We overvalue our worth and we undervalue other people's worth. We need to start seeing our value and seeing our brother's value coming together. Are you listening to me? Everybody in their grace, can I get an amen? amen. And that's how we're going to get the job done. Amen? amen? Romans chapter 12. Amen? Don't think of yourself too highly, lest you fall. I need a team, and I want that team to be called of heaven to hold rank in their position, in their assignment, in the light of eternity. Can I get an amen? amen. Come on, Jesus. Give, give Jesus a clap. <clears throat> I want everybody just to give. Go ahead, ushers, go ahead and collect the offering. And we're going to get the heaven out of here. And as you give, I want you to just stand up as you give today and lift your hands. We're going to worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord.